listening audience who is a sincere seeker of the truth, grab your scriptures, a pencil, and a piece of paper. You are about to hear the most profound, dynamic, soul-stirring information ever to reach the shores of America. You are about to hear a truth teacher, not a preacher. So come, let us step from the darkness into the true light with us Sayyid Ali Imam Isa al Hadi al Mahdi. نشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الوالي الكريم وصلى الله على أنبياء أجمعين والمسيح والمحدي والمجدد لمن مرسلين Are we not the bearers of witness that nothing would exist if Allah didn't create it? And that he is alone and has no partner? And that all gratitude is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the sustainer of all the boundless universes. All gratitude is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the generous eternal friend. And send salutations of Allah on all of his prophets and his apostles. And on the Messiah, the anointed one. And on the Mahdi, the guide. And on the Mujaddah, the reformer. Which was all sent from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We send greetings and we send peace throughout the boundless universe to all. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. And now, the true light featuring as Sayyid Al Imam Isa Al Hadi Al Mahdi. Actually, this is saying in essence, according to the way I see it, that we, uh, Nubians who are here, in the hells of Babylon, North America, are the chosen ones. There's also the fact that one of the first statements that Jesus made was, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. I'm using God for people. But the point is that here's Jesus standing in the midst of his disciples and refers to the peacemakers in a future tense. When he says, bless all the peacemakers, for they shall, they shall be called the children of God. Which means he did not classify his immediate surroundings as those peacemakers. If we take away from the language English which the Bible has been translated into, we would come up with, bless all the peacemakers. The word peacemaker is from the word salam. One who is of peace, meaning Muslim. So Jesus said, out of his mouth, Blessed are the Muslims, they shall be called the children of God. Now, if we look in the Revelation, in the 14th chapter, which starts to talk about the vision of the 144,000, it says, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion. The Zion is the new word for Jerusalem. Jerusalem means Jeru, city of Salaam, peace. Or as Muslims would say, abode of peace, Darul Islam, or Dinul Islam, to be in Deen Allah. So Jesus was telling people in his day that, like he mentions of the comforter, Muhammad would come, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, also to expect Muslims to come, and they will be called the children of God. And you'll recognize them a certain way. They'll be in a city of peace. They will not be wandering about the streets like multiple people with all different ideas and all different opinions. He goes on to give you another sign to know his people, and he says this, And with him, a hundred and forty-four thousand, and here's a very important point, having his father's name written on their forehead. Christians refer to themselves as Christians, which is using what they call Jesus' name, not his father's name. His father's name was not Christ. That is supposed to be his name according to mistranslation. And if we look in St. John chapter 1, you will find out that that wasn't even his name, but they say that they misinterpreted that also. But they are not using the Father's name. Every Muslim is called Abdullah, which means a slave or servant of Allah. This is a natural title 
that every Muslim picks up when they bear witness or get baptized or take their shahada. Okay? Having their father's name written in their forehead. And I heard a voice from the heavens as a voice of many waters and a voice of great thunder. And I heard the voice of the harpers hopping their harp. And they sung as it were a new song. What is the new song that they're singing? It's not the old time religion that they sing about in the churches. It's not the old gospels that they sing about. There's nothing new about those gospels. The new song represents that new resurrection of the dead. And they are singing it in a language that only they know it'll go on to say. And they sang as it were a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the 144,000 which were deemed from the earth. Redeemed means to be reclaimed who were on earth. Now, what the brother was trying to explain before about resurrection is that the resurrection of man is called the redemption, the reclaiming of man. David made it very clear in the 23rd Psalm that a man could be walking and yet dead. And what did he mean by walking and dead? That to be void of a soul is to be dead. Because it says in Genesis that the Lord breathed his spirit into man and man became a what? A living soul. And in St. John chapter 1 it says the same thing. However, when we read the 23rd Psalm, he says, he restoreth my soul. Meaning that there were men that in the eyes of the Almighty were walking around but classified dead because their soul was removed. How did they equate that soul in the Bible in St. John? They said, ye are like the salt of the earth. And what is salt when it has lost its savor? The soul is the spirit or a soul. Men in the Western Hemisphere are bodies who are void of the living word and spirit of the Almighty. They are walking dead. If you turn your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he's going to explain to you in detail how Christ did not die on the cross for anybody's sins, but moreover, how these were writings of men and that if they didn't keep them up, that they had been wasting their time, he's going to say. Now watch. Moreover, brethren, Paul, who is talking to the church of Corinthians, seeking out disciples of Jesus and followers of Christ, as they call him. Moreover, brethren, I declare, I declare unto you the gospel which I preach unto you, which also you have received, and wherein ye stand. He says that he's preaching to them about a gospel that they themselves had previously received and he has also received it and they based their life on it. You follow me so far? He said, by which also ye are saved. This doctrine that I preach and you receive is how you are saved. Now, Christians say in order to be saved, you must be born again. You must accept Christ as your personal savior and believe in the resurrection of Christ. Here it says that this doctrine, therefore, would be the redemption, resurrection of Christ, to be saved. So we read on. If ye keep in memory, memorize, what I preach unto you, if you remember what I preach to you, unless you have believed in vain, if you apply these things that I preached, which I was given, if you don't, you are living in vain. Watch what he says. For I delivered unto you first, the first thing I taught you, of all that which I also received. He's saying, I'm only teaching you, and the first thing I've taught you are things that was given to me myself. Not things he had experienced himself, because remember, Paul never saw Jesus in the flesh. He said, only what was given me am I preaching to you. Okay? How? Now here's what he's going to tell him what it was that he was taught how that Christ died for our sin. But then he adds another line. What is that line? According to the scripture. 
He's not saying this is something he knows. He's saying we have been taught and we've been preaching and by this preaching we are saved. If not, we're living in vain. And this is what it is that we preach, that Christ died on the cross according to the scripture, not according to what he knows or knew. Do you understand? And then he says, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scripture. As it had been written, Christ died and rose the third day. Now, Christians accept that, let's go to the scene of the cross, that the man on the cross confronted one of the other men who was strapped to a tree next to him and told him that I will be with you this day in heaven. This is written in the book of Matthew, that once one of the thieves question about Jesus' purpose of being on the cross, the other one interrupted and said, this man has committed no sin. And Jesus told him, what? I will be with you this day in heaven. Christians, on the other hand, are saying that Christ would go into the earth for three days and three nights and then raise back. This day means right now. They say then the clouds covered over the sky darkened and a voice yelled out, Father, it is over. Unto your hands I command my spirit. Christians say that Jesus resurrected in the spirit because Jesus' spirit was God. That Jesus was God and the Son of God. And therewith, if his body was not God, because he said, my spirit is well and my flesh is weak, his body must be man then his spirit must have been God. This is what Christians teach. If that is so, then how did he say, my father, it is over, unto your hands I command my spirit. If it was the father's spirit, then it couldn't have been Christ's spirit. And if it was Christ's spirit, it couldn't have been the father's spirit. And if it was the same spirit, the sentence would have no purpose. So we come up with a contradiction with the man who's on the cross at that point. And that he was buried and that he rose the third day again according to the scripture and that he was seen in Cyprus he was seen by somebody in Greece and then of the twelve who are the twelve are they his disciples is that what usually identified as the twelve in the Bible his disciples correct this is the book of Corinthians that was supposed to have been recorded after Jesus' crucifixion. If this was past his crucifixion, and according to the Bible, Judas went out and hung himself, there wouldn't have been 12 standing there. There would have only been 11. Because Judas would not have been there. So this book here has made another mistake, the book of Paul. But Christians base their teachings on this kind of mistake. He said there was 12 there. This was after the crucifixion. Judas is supposed to have hung himself. There should only be 11 standing there. Let's go on. It gets even worse. And after that, after he was seen in Greece, and then of 12, after that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once. There was 500 other followers of Christ that all saw him at once after the resurrection. That is not recorded in your Bible because there was not 500 men in the room when Jesus returned and was questioned. Was there? Only a portion of disciples and Mary Magdalene that met him at the tomb was at the upper room when Jesus was supposed to have appeared to them. 500 was not there. And of course, Judas was not there. Another mistake. Whom a greater part remained unto the present but some have fallen asleep. Some of these men, asleep here means death. Some of them are still alive, Paul says, but a large part of them have died or fallen away. After that, after this now, he was seen of James and then of the apostles. According to what it said earlier, he was seen of the twelve, which were the apostles. And if James was not one of the apostles and he was also taken out, which is Jesus' brother, his real name being Yahoo, then there was not 12 nor 11, there would have only been 10 standing there. Another mistake. 
These writings are what y'all are basing your teachings on. Because whenever Muslims are standing before an audience, they allow themselves to be questioned. But when we come back with the simple question, tell me something Jesus said himself about his resurrection from the dead. They can't do it. They can only quote to me Paul. And they can quote to me writings of the disciples. They can quote to you Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. They can quote to you Hebrews, Galatians, Thessalonians. But they never quote Jesus. Because none of the things they say, Jesus said. These were things put together by men who called themselves his disciples, like Paul, who never saw Jesus and persecuted Jesus and Jesus' teachings, which you'll get into. Okay? Then it says, and last of all, he was seen of me also, as of one born out of due time. He says, and he, James, saw Jesus, which we all know is not true, as if he was born out of due time. Either he means he saw Jesus in a future tense, or he means he saw Jesus in a past tense, which neither appear in his scripture. Now, for I am the least of the apostles that are meet or worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. You see what Paul says about himself? But, by the grace of God, I am what I am. He knew he was a devil. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than them all. He's saying, that he was not divinely inspired by anybody. He worked and earned this grace by his teaching. It's not a spiritual teaching of Jesus. It says in St. John, the grace and truth came through Jesus Christ, not through Paul. But Paul just took a portion of it just then. More abundantly than them all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. He took that right. Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach and ye believe. Whether it was me or the real disciples, he said, this is what we preach and this is what y'all believe. Whether it's true or false. Now listen to this man talk. This is what they base their teachings on here. What did he preach? Here's what he preached. He says in 12. Now, if Christ, now listen close, he preached, if Christ had preached that he rose from the dead, how say some amongst you that there is no resurrection of the dead? This means, now this ain't talking to you. <laughs> Stop fooling yourself. He is talking to the church of Corinthians, supposed to be Jesus' followers. And he's saying some of y'all are saying Jesus didn't resurrect. Now these are his followers 2,000 years ago, not today, not in these chilling eating churches. This is 2,000 years ago, a man who's there, supposed to be recording what he's seen and heard, saying that Jesus resurrected. How is it that some of you disciples right there don't believe it? Now I want you Christians to tell me, if they were there 2,000 years ago, where did they get the doubt from? Don't think the doubt originated 1970 with Imam Isa, or in Pakistan on Saudi Arabia, this Bible tells you right here, if you believe it, that those disciples in Corinthians that were supposed to be followers of Christ did not believe. Some of them didn't believe in the resurrection. But you choose in America in five language translation to accept it. Okay? But if there be, let me go back to 12. Now, if Christ had preached, that he rose from the dead, how say some amongst you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But, he says, if there be no resurrection of the dead, then Christ not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then our preaching is vain and your faith is vain. Now, he's not even sure. He said, well, if it's true that Christ did not raise from the dead, then all of our teachings are in vain. He's talking to those people of the so-called congregation who don't believe in the resurrection. Okay? Now watch. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God. He stepped away from his son and moved to the Father at this moment. 
and we have found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God, not Jesus, that he raised up Christ, the Messiah, whom he raised not up. If so be, the dead does not raise. He's saying that we will be found liars. We have blasphemed heaven if we tell the world that Christ resurrected from the dead if he did not. Okay? Now watch what he goes on to say. For if the dead raise not, then is Christ not raised. Correct? Now are we talking here about a dead body or a dead spirit? What type of death? Don't tell me that you're talking about only a physical resurrection because Jesus told Mary of Magdalene when she met him the next day, don't touch me because I have not risen yet. But go and tell the disciples I have risen, which is a lie. He told her right there, don't touch me because I have not risen yet. So she saw Jesus in this garden disguised as a gardener and she walked up behind him and said, have you seen the Lord? And he said, Behold thy Lord. And she said, Master, I thought that thou wast a gardener. And she stepped forth to touch him, and he said, Don't touch me, for I have not risen yet. So now, if this is supposed to be the day after the crucifixion, according to the Christians, Jesus was supposed to have raised. And he just said in the Bible, he had not risen yet. But, go tell them that I did. Isn't is that what Paul just said? If we told people he risen and he didn't, we have found false witness before God. Right in the Bible it says, But go tell them that I did. He hasn't risen yet. So the resurrection of the dead did not mean that he was bailed on some cross, pulled down and put in a tomb, and came out. Now if you tell me that the Lord, Jesus the Christ, came out of the tomb in the form of a spirit, then I ask you then why did they have to move the stone? Who moved the stone? If he was a spirit and the shroud is true, if he could penetrate the shroud and leave an impression, he would have penetrated the stone and left an impression. Somebody had to roll a stone to move a physical body. Because if it was a spiritual resurrection, would they have to move the stone is the question. You got to get more detail. You got to analyze because in some of the claims that you make, you mean well, but you're blaspheming the Heavenly Father by giving glory to his son, when his son himself, and I say son because all of ye are the sons of God. Jesus said, pray ye after this manner, our father, not my father, our father, all of our father, does that make you his daughter and you his son? Our father, who art where? You know the Lord's prayer, say it with me. Our Father who art where? You afraid? Was he on earth? Jesus was talking. Was the Father on earth with or in Jesus when he made this statement? Our Father who art in heaven. Jesus was standing on earth speaking about a Father who was in heaven, not on earth or in him. Our Father who art in heaven. Hallow, which is holy. Be thy name. I feel sorry for you people who got married in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You are living in sin. Holy is thy name, Jesus said. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. What's next? Thy kingdom come. Jesus was standing there. You said Jesus brought the kingdom of God to earth. Jesus said, your kingdom come, thy is your. Speaking about who? Who is he talking to? I'll go back to the beginning. Our Father, who art in heaven, holy is thy name. Your kingdom come. Whose kingdom must come? Jesus is our God. Your will be done. Whose will do you follow? Jesus is will of God. You call yourself Christian. You follow in Jesus' will. Jesus said, your will be done. Where? 
Now you say, well, on earth he's God. He didn't say that. He said, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus gave heaven and earth to the heavenly Father. He didn't claim earth or heaven. These are books outside of Jesus' teaching you to get all this stuff from. People who are Greek and Roman influenced, who believe in mortal worship. They only want to make Jesus a mortal so that they can justify killing him. So they can say they killed the ever-living God. Jesus must die for your sins. Yet Jesus came to give eternal life. There's a contradiction. Eternal life means you never die. How can you have eternal life and die at the same time? You understand? Our Father, who art in heaven, holy is your name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this for each day our daily bread. Don't be career making. You all people out there career making. I got to finish school and I got to get my job together. And I got Jesus said, give us each day our daily bread. Don't be living for tomorrow. Live for today. He went to his disciples who had their nets casted in water and told them to drop their nets. Stop their livelihood. Stop their occupation. Stop it all. Drop your nets and become fishes of men and spend your life spreading the gospel and trying to raise people back to life. But you got all these excuses for staying out there in the world and not dropping your net. Just like in Noah's time, they refused to come into the ark because it looked confined. And they were having fun outside the ark with recreation. They thought about the conditions of the ark with all those animals, how unclean it could be, how unsafe it could be. And they stayed outside the ark. This happened today. Again, our Father who art in heaven, Holy is thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. We now have for your listening pleasure a complete set of the True Light tapes. There are now more than 24 hours of answers to the questions that have boggled the minds of humanity. For more than 20 years, the eminent master, Imam Isa, has answered all questions put before him, from skeptics to true believers. Jews, Christians, Muslims, all have increased the understanding of the words of the Most High by listening to the True Light on WWRL. Where can I get the True Light tape? You can get the True Light from your local Ansar representative that you see dressed in white, or come down to the original tents of Kedar, 719 Bushwick Avenue in Brooklyn, New York. I still go to church, and I've asked my minister many questions from the True Light tape that he cannot answer. I've listened to Jimmy Swaggart and other ministers, but I find that El Imam Isa is the only one who can explain the book of Revelation. I've been a Jehovah Witness since I was a child, and I thought I had a monopoly on the truth. But I listened to the True Light tapes on the radio and have come to understand the truth about the life of Jesus. I listen to your broadcast every week. And as a result of the True Light tapes, I am now a follower of Imam Isa. Yes, the True Light tapes do make a difference. The True Light can change your life. You will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. And now, let us return to our broadcast.
temptation. Could Jesus be tempted? Could God, I'm using God for y'all, could God himself be tempted? The devil who was created as a mere angel of light and cast out of heaven at God's command can test God? <laughs> the devil can't test God. The devil could only test men. You understand that? Jesus said, lead us not into temptation. Jesus said, and deliver us, including himself, from evil. Now, the devil approached Jesus on the mountain. Remember that story? And told Jesus if he had bowed, if he would bow down to him, he would give him all that his eye behold. Now, let's ask the question. Are you trying to tell me that the devil would not have recognized God in Jesus? And if the devil recognized God in Jesus, then the devil was there at the foundation of the world when God, who you call Jesus, created everything. So he knows, according to the Bible, that the heavens and the earth belong to God, but he was the beginning and the ending. So why would he come and offer God, who owned the whole planet and all the universes, one city? He offered a man. The devil who was confronting Jesus was looking at a man, and he thought this man can be bribed. And he offered a man the city and said, if you prostrate before me, I'll give you all your eyes behold. He could not offer God. So the very devil, Lucifer, Satan, the fallen angel, saw him as a man. I don't know how come you don't. It's very plain that thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation. And here Jesus asks, and deliver us from evil. And then he feels this prayer, for yours is the kingdom, for thine is the kingdom, the kingdom is yours, Heavenly Father, and yours is the glory, and yours is the power. For how long did he say? For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for how long? Ever and ever. Amen. Will Jesus ever intercede and have his own kingdom? No. What he will do is he will raise a people to a city called Zion. And then it says in the book of Revelation, which happens to be the only book that belongs to Jesus, because this book begins... This is a revelation which God gave unto Jesus to show unto his people what must shortly come to pass. Now, no other book in the Bible says that. The only one that saw John doesn't say that, Luke, Matt, only one that says that is Revelation. And it says in the 21st chapter of Revelation that the angels came and prostrated before Jesus and he said, Get up, because I am your fellow brother in tribulation in this day. And I'll get to Corinthians where it says all rule was put under the Lord's feet and Jesus himself was put under the Lord's feet. So Jesus himself will appear as a mortal and be subject to the same laws as you. He said, Jesus said, I come not to change the law but to confirm it. In order to confirm it, he must live it. God has to live laws he gave to man. <laughs> Jesus said, I was not sent, but to the Lord sheep of the house of Israel only. God is particular. Why don't you see that you're talking about a man? Because you want to make him somebody you can lean on. Because it is so simple for you to drive the car and you to have the accident and I receive the pain. This is what y'all want. He died for my sin. You say Jesus came into the world to remove sin. Isn't that what the Christians teach? So Jesus came into the world 2,000 years ago. You want everybody to jump in the bus and go down to the village and see if people are still sinning? If he came into the world to remove sin and establish righteousness, and it says that at the beginning of St. John, why is there still sin in the world? And why is there so much unrighteousness? Jesus said, Blessed is he who is persecuted after righteous name's sake. 
for his is the kingdom of heaven, not earth. Christians are not persecuted for righteousness. Go home and tell your mother you want to become a Jehovah Witness or a seven-day Adventist or a born-again Christian. They say, wonderful. Hallelujah. Amen. Go home and tell them you're Muslim. Immediately you got to be brainwashed. <laughs> you got to belong to a cult. And they're only looking at dictionary to find out the Catholic Church, the Baptist Church, the Episcopalian, all of these, any organized body of people is a cult. A cult means a group of people believing in any one thing. I'll move on. And it says, And if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain. Ye are yet in your sin. Are men still in sin? Yes or no? Answer is yes. Then the resurrection didn't take place yet. Because if Jesus was to resurrect and did, sin would be gone by that confirmation. That confirmation is made in the Bible, but man is still sinning. Move on to 18. Then they also, which are fallen asleep in Christ, are perished. All those who have died, even that resurrection, will never come back, he said, if, that, if this was so. 19. If in this life, now watch this statement. If in this life only we have Hope in Christ. Now what does that mean? If all our hope in this life is only in Christ, he says right in the 19th verse, we are of all men most miserable. Right there, right in the Corinthians. If you people are living your life for Christ and not his Father, call yourself Christ-like and being born again, everything is for Christ, you are a miserable lot of people, he says. If you got all your life based on Christ and not his father, because people have forgotten his father because they're so caught up on the sun. They're like Muslims who forgot the Quran because they're caught up on Hadith. You are miserable, it says, right in the Bible. I hope you're following me. But now, he goes on in 20. If Christ risen from the dead and became and become, which is, I'm sorry, I said became as if it was past tense. But if you look at your Bible, you see it's become, which is future tense. Now he's talking about something that shall happen. So that means in Paul time, which was after Christ, it hadn't happened yet either. Go on. But now, it is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruit of them that slept. It already told you who the ones who are that slept. Those are his disciples who have died. Now it tells you that if that's so, then Christ will be the first of them to rise. Correct? Now watch what it says. For since by man came resurrection, wait a minute, I made a mistake. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of dead. Now, according to this, whose idea was the resurrection of dead? According to this 21st verse of the 1st Corinthians chapter 15, hope you're writing it, who is the one who came up with the concept of resurrection? I'll read it again. For since by man came death because of what Adam did, by man came also resurrection, the resurrection of the dead. This is the result of man. All right. If Jesus was not man, if he was God, then this statement would not apply to him. The statement, therefore, which is followed by the one before that he had to do with the resurrection, is telling you that Jesus was a man. Said that Adam was a man, and he caused man to die. So from another man, we will get resurrected. That's what it says in the Bible. I don't know where y'all get all your other stuff from. But this is what the Bible says word for word. I'm just reading it to you. All this other stuff y'all get, I don't know where you get it from. But I know you better be careful because the devil is out here to trick you. That he'll, he'll even fool the intelligent elite. Because you won't follow the word by word. You start ad-libbing and listening to preachers. 
So I'm going word by word. Can you follow that? It's very simple. Now listen to 22. For as in Adam all die, even so in the Messiah, we have Christ, which is the word Messiah, shall all be made alive. Now what does that mean? When they say in Adam all die, did they mean that the moment Adam committed sin, nobody else would be born? Or the day you're born, you die? Now Christians thought that's what it meant. Because they said the wages of sin are death. And then they thought about saying, and you're born of sin. If the wages of sin are death, and you're born of sin, the day you're born, you'll die. You see, the wages of sin are death, and you're born of sin. How stupid can one be? Listen to this teaching. Christianity is one of those. Listen, it is the greatest story ever told, like they say. And your mother told you, never call your little brother a liar, say he tells stories. <laughs> it is the greatest, like they say on Christmas, the greatest story ever told. They're right. It is the best lie that the devil ever came up with. This crucifixion of Christ and resurrection so you can go on and continue to sin from Sunday to Sunday and on judgment day you'll be raised. People leave the church and drink and cuss and fight. Get to jail. Are there more Christians in jail or more Muslims? Christians are doing more killing and robbing and raping. All the people you kill every time you turn on television. Well, now, if a Muslim commits a crime, they make it a point to say, black Muslim kill somebody. Black Muslims have fights. Black Muslims have shootout with cops. But when the other night, this guy shot down this old man and this old woman, they caught him. They didn't say, Catholic shoots down old man and old woman. Baptist stabs mother in house. Baptist couple burns baby in oven and says he's the devil. They don't go that. Only when it's Muslim do they point out religion. But when it's anybody else, they say the person's name. And if they want to be a little dirty, they say his nationality. When it's white, they sometimes say male. When it's black, they say Negro male, black male. How long are y'all going to be duped? How long are you going to have? Isaiah tells you in 52 to shake the chains, the shackles, and stand up. How long is that white devil teaching you all these fake teachings about the Messiah Christ, the Savior to the world, who came to remove the world from sin? He said he came to remove the sin out of the world. Yes, but... What did he say to his people in St. John chapter 14? There are many things I have to say unto you. However, you cannot bear them now. Let me ask you a question. Is that the ground to build a church on? An incomplete doctrine? Hell, man, make a statement to you. I have many things to teach you, but you can't bear them now. So now go in that car and disarm that nitroglycerin. <laughs> He's asking you to take a bomb apart and only going to give you half of the instructions. Would you go do it? Who gave these people the right to set up a church when Jesus said in St. John chapter 14, there's many things I have to tell you, however you can't bear them yet. That means not until he completes his mission did they have the right to set up a church. But they went and set up churches any, any, any and everywhere. Four and five churches on the same block. Mount Zion and, and Reverend Chimney's church and Pastor Barbecue's church. Five and six churches on one block. They can't even get it together. Because there's so much confusion in their words. They don't read the text. They listen to preachers. They read the Bible like I'm doing word for word. They'll see that none of that took place. Go on. It says, but every man in his own order. This is the resurrection they're talking about. Every man in his own order. Christ, the first fruit. Fruit. Look at the word. Is it single or plural? Huh? You see it in there? Look at it. It says Christ, the first fruit. They talk about a group of Christ. Messiahs. And then it says, afterwards, they that were, those that are Christ, at his coming.
coming. So there's two resurrections, like it says in Revelation. Those who resurrect first are the spiritual Christ people, the Messiahs, which are all the prophets. They resurrect first, and then those at the end at his coming will be raised. But we've already established it does not mean from the grave. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me to the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Those are the three statements. The name of the Father on the head. The resurrection of the dead by reestablishing a soul. Was anybody without a soul was void of the light. And in him was the light, and the light was the light of man, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehendeth it not. So it says that the soul is the key to life, and man can be walking without a soul, and therefore be the walking dead. There's many mummies. Just go to any Christian church and load it with mummies. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God. Delivered up the kingdom to God. Why? Because they say, thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. So people must start to live on earth as they are in heaven. And in heaven it says around about the throne are twenty and four elders. How are they dressed? In white robes. Is that what it says in the Bible? So you recognize those people who are on earth as it is in heaven, but they'll be down in white robes. They'll live on earth as if they're in heaven. Heaven is inside a garden, according to the Bible. So you must live with inside the garden. If you fall victim in the garden and get cast out or leave, that's your own. If Rhea, Noah's son, decided not to get into the ark, he died in the flood. That was his own decision. And his mother fallen. Don't let nobody fool you now. It's too late in time. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom of God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. The Almighty is going to put down all rule, all might, and all power. This is true, and Christ is here, and he did all of that. According to y'all who is coming, then there'd be no more rulers in the world. They're not talking about Christ having the power to do it. They're talking about the Father having the power to do it. Christ was just one of his messiahs, one of his prophets, one of his saviors, guided by his angels. 25. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Then, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. What does that mean? The last thing you will get is eternal life. The last thing. So stop thinking just by accepting Christ as your personal Savior, you got eternal life. That's not what the Bible says. That's what some preacher said. Am I reading the Bible or am I making this up? I'm reading to you right out the Bible. For he has put all things under his feet. But... Talking about, now they're talking about Christ, and they're going to go into an exception. But, when he said, all things are put under him, when he said, Jesus had power to rule the earth, it is manifest that he is accepting, that he is exempting, which did put all things under him. He's not talking about the Heavenly Father, it's going to go and say. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. So at the end, will you reign with Christ, or will you reign with his Father, and Christ be there, according to this Bible? You follow me? If you follow me, just nod your head, so I know I'm not alone, because it's very simple. Any man can see it. I can go on and on with this chapter. And it's very clear. It goes into the resurrection in detail. But I'm probably occupying a lot of the questions y'all would like to ask. But don't be fooled. 
God would not allow any mortal to crucify his Messiah. It was made to look that way for those who needed the death for resurrection. This question pertains to uh, Joshua chapter 5, the first verse. <clears throat> and it came to pass when all the kingdom, kings of the Amorites, which were on the side of Jordan westward, and all the kings of the Canaanites, which were by the sea, heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of Jordan from before the children of Israel until we were passed over, that their heart melted, neither was their spirit in them anymore because of the children of Israel. Uh, prior to that, I know this is speaking of, of the Canaanites and so forth. Prior to that, did they actually have care and concern for their uh, fellow people? And then after that, this is where they lost their... Uh, the problem with this quote is that, again, the devil plays tricks with you. He keeps making y'all think that the word spirit and soul means the same thing. Listen, Ansar Allah is saying the devil does not have a soul. We're not saying he does not have a spirit. Everything that's alive has a spirit. Spirit is used for uh, a viver. It's used to mean aggressiveness. It has many different meanings. In the language we have ruh, which means soul, and we have nafs, which means spirit. All right? And the same thing happens in Hebrew as it does in Arabic and Aramic. Same language. What we're saying is that shaitan, the devil, is an unholy spirit because he does not allow the soul of Allah to reside in him. Because he says in Genesis that I blew into man the breath of life and man became a living ruh, soul. The Quran confirms that Allah sends down all his angels, wa ruh, and a soul. So the angels descending from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who has the hala or the aura of Allah, the light of Allah, that is soul. That is the emotional body. That is the divine love. Now, the devil, or the white man, or the jinn, as the Quran recalls him many times, does have instinct. Just like two dogs, if one dog is crossing the street and one gets hit by a car, another dog will stop and cry. You've heard dogs cry. That is instinct to me. But to have emotions for the concerns of the world is impossible in a person that continues to make more weapons. That's impossible in a person that puts the speed limit at 55 miles an hour, watches people kill themselves, and then makes cars with 180 miles an hour on the speedometer. It's impossible in a person who says cigarettes kill people and then allows cigarette commercials on television. This is showing that the essence of them is not there. Though they can emulate emotions, the essence is not there. And this is what we're saying. He's void of the essence of concern. Not that he can't act like he's concerned. He can act like he has soul in his records. Now he does the whole thing. But he has the essence, the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in him as a ruh is not there. This basically, this quote is used not to say at this point in history, the devils lost their soul. No. At this point, when the Canaanites and the Amhari saw what the children of Israel did and saw how the Almighty had parted the water for them a second time, their pursuit lost all purpose. You understand what I'm saying? They were in pursuit of the children of Israel. When they saw the power of the loss of Fanu Ta'ala in that quote, come down and part the water of the Jordan for Israel, they lost their spirit. Their hearts melted. They had no more courage to aggress or attack or to overcome the children of Israel. Even though it's used like they've lost their soul, it means they lost their spirit. Their essence is gone. Right? But I'm constantly getting into it with, the, with the Masons, the Jehovah Witnesses, uh -huh. the Evangelists, the Pentecostals, Baptists, etc., etc. Uh -huh. Over one, over over uh, various concepts of what they believe Islam is. Yes, they 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 uh, sincerely believe that that Jesus Christ is the only begotten Son of God. Where Muslims believe that He begets not as begotten. 
No, 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 no. no. You got that backwards. <laughs> I got that backwards. Muslims, are not, we don't have any problem with Jesus being the Son of God as long as you recognize that Jesus is a Son of God and not the Son of God, well. which the Bible will support. That's what Muslims believe. When we say in the Holy Quran, Lam yalid wa lam yulad wa lam yakul lahu kubu'an ahad. And bad translators say he did not beget nor have he begotten. That's bad translation. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says lam, it means definitely did not. Lam yalid would conceive. The word led or walada means to give birth or conception, not begot. So the translators mess up and say begot. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. وَلَمْ يَقُلْ لَهُ كُبُعًا أَحَدٍ It says, definitely, he did not give birth to a son, nor was he born by any mother and father. وَلَمْ يَقُلْ لَهُ كُبُعًا أَحَدٍ And it does not exist any female or counterpart who is equal to him so in so that they could come together and give birth. And this is not talking about Jesus. This is talking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Jesus is just merely one of the many sons of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, you know, in any way, do we Muslims mean he is the son of Allah? No way. He's just a son of Allah. And when the Christians say Jesus is the son of God, they're saying the right thing if they only take the time to read what Jesus had to say about it. They get a little bit closer to its meaning. Mm -hmm. also, in fact... If you open your Bible, you have a Bible with you? Not right now. Sir. Well, let somebody do it for you. Mm -hmm. Luke 4:41. Go ahead. Find it, this is what you tell the Jehovah's Witness when they say that Jesus is the only Son of God. <laughs> Luke 4:41. This is what I call martial arts with the Holy Scriptures. This is a free country. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh. Anybody has it open? Luke. Yes. Verse 4. 41. Okay, got you. And devils also came out of many, crying out and saying, Thou art Christ, the Son of God. And he rebuking them, suffering them not to speak, for they knew that he was Christ. See, these demons were people or demons coming out calling Jesus the Son of God. He stopped them from saying that because he said they knew that he was Christ. That he was the Messiah, but they were telling people, no, he is the Son of God. Go to Luke 9, verse 20, while you're there. He said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? Peter answering said, The Christ of God. The, uh -huh. the Christ of God. That's Not right. See how they combined the two? Now watch. Go ahead. Right on to 21. And he straightly charged them and commanded them to tell no man that thing. He said, don't tell people that. Now, why did Jehovah's Witnesses tell the people that if Jesus said, don't tell people that I am the Son of God? Well, I know one thing for sure. They'll, 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 they'll do anything at any cost to uh, try to gain their, <laughs> their own consent to eat, You're right. to eat swine. You know, you know it. As, as far as I'm concerned, it's all they're really interested. Yeah, you're right. right. <laughs> they, want to play, they want the right to do what they feel like doing, whether it's right or wrong. They don't care about what the scripture says, because right. I can show you quote after quote where the Son of God is repeated for, for men, for Solomon, for David, for Ephraim, for Israel, throughout the Bible. But then they'll still say he's the only begotten of the Father. I'll turn them right to Psalms chapter 2, and they'll say David is the only begotten of the Father. And then they'll say... Ephraim is the only begotten of the, of the Father, or my firstborn of the Father. Moses is my firstborn in Exodus 4, 22. Matthew 3, 7, about the baptism, I baptize my beloved son. As you go, you go to 1 Chronicles 22, 10. Jacob, uh, 2 Samuel 17, 13 and 14. Israel is mine, Jacob is mine. And they'll look at these things, they'll read them, and they still will say, uh-huh. Jesus is the only begotten of the Father. So then you realize when the Quran says there are people on the earth that are summun, bukmun, and ummun, deaf, dumb, and blind, and they'll keep wandering into darkness, you know who you're talking about. I just showed you right there where he said, don't call me that. So they do it anyway. So that's between them and Jesus on Judgment Day.
ربنا أكمل لنا نورنا وأكبر لنا إنك على كل شيء قدير. This is from the 66th surah of the Holy Quran, the 8th verse. And read, O oh, sustainer, complete for us our life. And forgive us, for surely you have the power over all things. Sincere seeker of the truth, grab your scriptures, a pencil, and a piece of paper. You are about to hear the most profound, dynamic, soul stirring information ever to reach the shores of America. You are about to hear a true teacher, not a preacher. So come, let us step from the darkness into the true light with As Sayyid Ali Imam Isa Al Hadi of Mountain. نشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الوالي الكريم وصلى الله على أنبياء أجمعين والمسيح والمحدي والمجدد لمن مرسلين Are we not the bearers of witness that nothing would exist if Allah didn't create it? And that He is alone and has no partner? And that all gratitude is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the sustainer of all the boundless universes? All gratitude is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the generous eternal friend? And send salutations of Allah on all of His prophets and His apostles and on the Messiah, the anointed one. And on the Mahdi, the guy, and on the Mujaddid, the reformer, which was all sent from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We send greetings and we send peace throughout the boundless universe to all. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. And now, the true light featuring As Sayyid Al Imam Isa Al Hadi Al Mahdi. Actually, this is saying in essence, according to the way I see it, that we uh, Nubians who are here in the hells of Babylon, North America, are the chosen ones. There's also the fact that one of the first statements that Jesus made was, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. I'm using God for people. But the point is that here's Jesus standing in the midst of his disciples and he refers to the peacemakers in a future tense when he says, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall, they shall be called the children of God, which means he did not classify his immediate surroundings as those peacemakers. If we take away from the language English which the Bible has been translated into, we would come up with blessed are the peacemakers. The word peacemaker is from the word salam one who is of peace, meaning Muslim. 
So Jesus said out of his mouth, Blessed are the Muslims, they shall be called the children of God. Now, if we look in the Revelation in the 14th chapter, which starts to talk about the vision of the 144,000, it says, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion. So Zion is the new word for Jerusalem. Jerusalem means Jeru, city of Salam, peace. Or as Muslims would say, abode of peace, Darul Islam, or Dinul Islam, to be in Deen Allah. So Jesus was telling people in his day that, like he mentions of the Comforter, Muhammad would come, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, also to expect Muslims to come, and they will be called the children of God, and you'll recognize them a certain way. They'll be in a city of peace. They will not be wandering about the streets like multiple people with all different ideas and all different opinions. He goes on to give you another sign to know his people, and he says this, and with him, 144,000, and here's a very important point, having his father's name written on their forehead. Christians refer to themselves as Christians, which is using what they call Jesus' name, not his father's name. His father's name was not Christ. That is supposed to be his name according to mistranslation. And if we look in St. John chapter 1, we'll find out that that wasn't even his name, that they say that they misinterpreted that also. But they are not using their father's name. Every Muslim is called Abdullah, which means a slave or servant of Allah. This is a natural title that every Muslim picks up when they bear witness or get baptized or take their shahada. Okay? Having their father's name written in their forehead. And I heard a voice from the heavens as the voice of many waters and a voice of great thunder. And I heard the voice of the hoppers hopping their harp. And they sung as it were a new song. What is the new song that they're singing? It's not the old time religion that they sing about in the churches. It's not the old gospels that they sing about. There's nothing new about those gospels. The new song represents that new resurrection of the dead. And they are singing it in a language that only they know it'll go on to say. And they sang as it were a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the 144,000 which were deemed from the earth. Redeemed means to be reclaimed who were on earth. Now, what the brother was trying to explain before about resurrection is that the resurrection of man is called the redemption, the reclaiming of man. David made it very clear in the 23rd Psalm that a man could be walking and yet dead. And what did he mean by walking and dead? That to be void of a soul is to be dead. Because it says in Genesis that the Lord breathed his spirit into man and man became a what? A living soul. And in St. John chapter 1 it says the same thing. However, when we read the 23rd Psalm, he says, He restoreth my soul. Meaning that there were men that in the eyes of the Almighty were walking around but classified dead because their soul was removed. How did they equate that soul in the Bible in St. John? They said, ye are like the salt of the earth. And what is salt when it has lost its savor? The salt is the spirit or the soul. Men in the Western Hemisphere are bodies who are void of the living word and spirit of the Almighty. They are walking dead. If you turn your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, He's going to explain to you in detail how Christ did not die on the cross for anybody's sins, but moreover, how these were writings of men, and that if they didn't keep them up, that they had been wasting their time, he's going to say. Now what? Moreover, brethren, Paul, who is talking to the church of Corinthians, seeking out disciples of Jesus and followers of Christ, as they call him. Moreover, brethren, I declare, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, 
which also you have received, and wherein ye stand. He says that he's preaching to them about a gospel that they themselves had previously received, and he has also received it, and they based their life on it. To so follow me so far. He says, by which also ye are saved. This doctrine that I preach and you receive is how you are saved. Now, Christians say in order to be saved, you must be born again. You must accept Christ as your personal Savior and believe in the resurrection of Christ. Here it says that this doctrine, therefore, would be the redemption, resurrection of Christ to be saved. So we read on. If ye keep in memory, memorize what I preach unto you, if you remember what I preach to you, unless you have believed in vain, if you apply these things that I preach, which I was given, if you don't, you are living in vain. Watch what he says. For I delivered unto you first, the first thing I taught you, of all that which I also received. He's saying, I'm only teaching you, and the first thing I've taught you are things that was given to me myself. Not things he had experienced himself, because remember, Paul never saw Jesus in the flesh. He said, only what was given me am I preaching to you. Okay? How? Now here's what he's going to tell him what it was that he was taught. How that Christ died for our sin. But then he adds another line. What is that line? According to the scripture. He's not saying this is something he knows. He's saying we have been taught and we've been preaching. And by this preaching we are saved. If not, we're living in vain. And this is what it is that we preach, that Christ died on the cross according to the scripture, not according to what he knows or knew. You understand? And then he says, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scripture. As it had been written, Christ died and rose the third day. Now, Christians accept that, let's go to the scene of the cross. That the man on the cross confronted one of the other men who was strapped to a tree next to him and told him that I will be with you this day in heaven. This is written in the book of Matthew. That once one of the thieves questioned about Jesus' purpose of being on the cross, the other one interrupted and said, This man has committed no sin. And Jesus told him, what? I will be with you this day in heaven. Christians, on the other hand, are saying that Christ would go into the earth for three days and three nights and then raise back. This day means right now. They say then the clouds covered over the sky darkened and a voice yelled out, Father, it is over. Unto your hands I command my spirit. Christians say that Jesus resurrected in the spirit because Jesus' spirit was God. That Jesus was God and the Son of God. And therewith, if his body was not God, because he said, my spirit is willing, my flesh is weak, his body must be man, then his spirit must have been God. This is what Christians teach. If that is so, then how did he say, my father, it is over, unto your hands I command my spirit. If it was the Father's Spirit, then it couldn't have been Christ's Spirit. And if it was Christ's Spirit, it couldn't have been the Father's Spirit. And if it was the same Spirit, the sentence would have no purpose. So we come up with a contradiction with the man who's on the cross at that point. He says, And that he was buried, and that he rose the third day, again, according to the Scripture. And that he was seen in Cyprus. He was seen by somebody in Greece. And then of the twelve. Who are the twelve? Are they his disciples? Is that what usually identified as the twelve in the Bible? His disciples, correct? This is the book of Corinthians that was supposed to have been recorded after Jesus' crucifixion. If this was past his crucifixion, and according to the Bible, Judas went out and hung himself, there wouldn't have been twelve standing there. They would have only been 11, because Judas would not have been there. So this book here has made another mistake, the book of Paul. But Chris 
Nixon based their teachings on this kind of mistake. He said there was 12 there. This was after the crucifixion. Judas is supposed to have hung himself. There should only be 11 standing there. Let's go on. It gets even worse. And after that, after he was seen in Greece, and then of 12, after that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once. 500 other followers of Christ that all saw him at once after the resurrection. That is not recorded in your Bible because there was not 500 men in the room when Jesus returned and was questioned. Was there? Only a portion of disciples and Mary Magdalene that met him at the tomb was in the upper room when Jesus was supposed to have appeared to them. 500 was not there. And, of course, Judas was not there. Another mistake whom a greater part remain unto the present, but some have fallen asleep. Some of these men asleep here means death. Some of them are still alive, Paul says, but a large part of them have died or fallen away. After that, after this now, he was seen of James and then of the apostles. According to what he said earlier, he was seen of the twelve which were the apostles. And if James was not one of the apostles, and he was also taken out, which is Jesus' brother, his real name being Yahoo, then there was not twelve, nor eleven, there would have only been ten standing there. Another mistake. These writings are what y'all are basing your teachings on. Because whenever Muslims are standing before an audience, they allow themselves to be questioned. But when we come back with the simple question, tell me something Jesus said himself, about his resurrection from the dead. They can't do it. They can only quote to me Paul. And they can quote to me writings of the disciples. They can quote to you Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. They can quote to you Hebrews, Galatians, Thessalonians. But they never quote Jesus. Because none of the things they say, Jesus said. These were things put together by men who call themselves his disciples, like Paul, who never saw Jesus and persecuted Jesus and Jesus' teachings, which you'll get into. Okay? Then it says, And last of all, he was seen of me also, as of one born out of due time. He says, And he, James, saw Jesus, which we all know is not true, as if he was born out of due time. Either he means he saw Jesus in a future tense, or he means he saw Jesus in a past tense, which neither appear in his scripture. Now, for I am the least of the apostles that are meet or worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. You see what Paul says about himself? But by the grace of God, I am what I am. He knew he was a devil. And his grace, which was betrothed upon me, was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than them all. He's saying that he was not divinely inspired by anybody. He worked and earned this grace by his teaching. It's not a spiritual teaching of Jesus. It says in St. John, the grace and truth came through Jesus Christ, not through Paul. But Paul just took a portion of it just then more abundantly than them all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. He took that right. Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach and ye believe. Whether it was me or the real disciples, he said, this is what we preach and this is what you all believe. Whether it's true or false. Now listen to this man talk. This is what they base their teachings on here. What did he preach? Here's what he preached. He says in 12. Now, if Christ, now listen close, be preached, if Christ had preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? This means, now this ain't talking to you. <laughs> Stop fooling yourself. He is talking to the church of Corinthians, supposed to be Jesus' followers. And he's saying, some of y'all are saying Jesus didn't resurrect. 
Now, these are his followers 2,000 years ago. Not today. Not in these chilling eating churches. This is 2,000 years ago. A man who's there supposed to be recording what he's seen and heard saying that Jesus resurrected. How is it that some of you disciples right there don't believe it? Now, I want you Christians to tell me if they were there 2,000 years ago, where did they get the doubt from? Don't think the doubt originated 1970 with Imam Isa or in Pakistan or in Saudi Arabia. This Bible tells you right here, if you believe it, that those disciples in Corinthians that were supposed to be followers of Christ did not believe. Some of them didn't believe in the resurrection. But you choose in America in five language translations to accept it. Okay? But if there be, let me go back to 12. Now, if Christ had preached that he rose from the dead, how say some amongst you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But, he said, if there be no resurrection of the dead, then Christ not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then our preaching is vain and your faith is vain. Now, he's not even sure. He said, well, if it's true that Christ did not raise from the dead, then all of our teachings are in vain. He's talking to those people of the so-called congregation who don't believe in the resurrection. Okay? Now what? Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God. He stepped away from his son and moved to the Father at this moment. And we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God, not of Jesus, that he raised up Christ, the Messiah, whom he raised not up. If so be, the dead does not raise. He's saying that we will be found liars. We have blasphemed heaven if we tell the world that Christ resurrected from the dead if he did not. Okay? Now watch what he goes on to say. For if the dead raise not, then is Christ not raised. Correct? Now, are we talking here about a dead body or a dead spirit? What type of death? Don't tell me that you're talking about only a physical resurrection because Jesus told Mary of Magdalene when she met him the next day, don't touch me because I have not risen yet. But go and tell the disciples I have risen, which is a lie. He told her right there, don't touch me. Because I have not risen yet. So she saw Jesus in this garden, disguised as a gardener, and she walked up behind him and said, Have you seen the Lord? And he said, Behold thy Lord. And she said, Master, I thought that thou wast a gardener. And she stepped forth to touch him, and he said, Don't touch me, for I have not risen yet. So now, if this is supposed to be the day after the crucifixion, According to the Christians, Jesus was supposed to have raised. And he just said in the Bible, he had not risen yet. But, go tell them that I did. Is this not what Paul just said? If we told people he risen and he didn't, we have found false witness before God. Right in the Bible, it says, but, go tell them that I did. He hasn't risen yet. So the resurrection of the dead did not mean that he was bailed on some cross pulled down and put in a tomb and came out. Now, if you tell me that the Lord, Jesus the Christ, came out of the tomb in the form of a spirit, then I ask you, then why did they have to move the stone? Who moved the stone? If he was a spirit and the shroud is true, if he could penetrate the shroud and leave an impression, he would have penetrated the stone and left an impression. Somebody had to roll a stone to move a physical body. Because if it was a spiritual resurrection, would they have to move the stone is the question. You got to get more detail. You got to analyze because in some of the claims that you make, you mean well, but you're blaspheming the Heavenly Father by giving glory to His Son. When His Son Himself, and I say Son because all of ye are the sons of God. Jesus said, pray ye after this manner. Our Father, not my Father, our Father, all of our Father. Does that make you his daughter and you his son? Our Father, who art where? You know the Lord's Prayer. Say it with me. 
our Father who art where? You afraid? Was he on earth? Jesus was talking. Was the Father on earth with or in Jesus when he made this statement? Our Father who art in heaven. Jesus was standing on earth thinking about a Father who was in heaven, not on earth or in him. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed, which is holy, be thy name. I feel sorry for you people who got married in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You are living in sin. Holy is thy name, Jesus said. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. What's next? Thy kingdom come. Jesus was standing there. You said Jesus brought the kingdom of God to earth. Jesus said, your kingdom come. Thy is your. Speaking about who? Who is he talking to? I'll go back to the beginning. Our Father, who art in heaven, holy is thy name. Your kingdom come. Whose kingdom must come? Jesus is our God. Your will be done. Whose will do you follow? Jesus' will of God. You call yourself Christian. You follow in Jesus' will. Jesus said, your will be done. Where? Now you say, well, on earth he's God. He didn't say that. He said, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus gave heaven and earth to the heavenly Father. He didn't claim earth or heaven. These are books outside of Jesus' teaching you to get all this stuff from. People who are Greek and Roman influenced, who believe in mortal worship. They only want to make Jesus a mortal so that they can justify killing him. So they can say they killed the ever-living God. Jesus must die for your sins. Yet Jesus came to give eternal life. There's a contradiction. Eternal life means you never die. How can you have eternal life and die at the same time? You understand? Our Father, who art in heaven, holy is your name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this or each day our daily bread. Don't be career making. You all people out there career making. I got to finish school and I got to get my job together. And I got Jesus said, give us each day our daily bread. Don't be living for tomorrow. Live for today. He went to his disciples who had their nets casted in water and told them to drop their nets, stop their livelihood, stop their occupation, stop it all. Drop your nets and become fishes of men and spend your life spreading the gospel and trying to raise people back to life. But you got all these excuses for staying out there in the world and not dropping your nets. Just like in Noah's time, they refused to come into the ark because it looked confined. And they were having fun outside the ark with recreation. They thought about the conditions of the ark with all those animals, how unclean it could be, how unsafe it could be, and they stayed outside the ark. This happened today. Again, our Father who art in heaven, holy is thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. We now have for your listening pleasure a complete set of the True Light tapes. There are now more than 24 hours of answers to the questions that have boggled the minds of humanity. For more than 20 years, the eminent master, Imam Isa, has answered all questions put before him, from skeptics to true believers. Jews, Christians, Muslims, all have increased the understanding of the words of the Most High by listening to the True Light on WWRL. Where can I get the True Light tapes? You can get the True Light from your local Ansar representative that you see dressed in white, or come down to the original tents of Kedar, 719 Bushwick Avenue in Brooklyn, New York. 